today we have, we're fortunate to have an internationally famous author, Gordon Chan, um, to give us a talk on his perspective on how to dismantle uh, the North Korean's nuclear uh, program. Uh, Gordon uh, is a uh, well-known, uh, even before he's a, he's a professional writer, and he was a lawyer in New York and in Hong Kong, right? And then eventually in Shanghai and many, many years. And he saw the financial world in Shanghai, how the Chinese banking system and the other system worked. And he came up with a, basically a, 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 a book that basically shook the world. It's called The, the Coming Collapse of China. It's talking about all the problems of China. And recently, he, he went on to tackle the uh, North Korean issues. And he's been um, uh, a very popular speaker uh, all over the place. He comes to Washington, DC, and more than, more often than I go to Washington, DC. But he said he goes to the higher power places to talk. Uh, and uh, he also appeared on Daily Show. I happened to watch Daily Show. It was actually very, very, he told me that I never try to be funny with John Stewart because he's always funnier than you are. That's right. Yeah. Uh, so uh, without further ado, I'll give you uh, Gordon Chan. Thanks very much. Last Wednesday, the International Atomic Energy Agency announced that North Korea had barred its inspectors from the reprocessing facility in Yongbin. This development closely followed Pyongyang's demand that the agency, which is the UN nuclear watchdog, remove its seals from nuclear equipment and take down its surveillance cameras. The North Koreans have reportedly ordered the IAEA inspectors to leave the country. The North says it will start reprocessing plutonium in a few days. Even if the North Koreans cannot reprocess so soon due to technical reasons, it's nonetheless clear that Kim Jong-il, or whoever else is running the country at this moment, has decided to repudiate three years of disarmament agreements reached after a half decade of negotiations. As the foreign ministry said two Fridays ago, North Korea, quote, will go its own way. I believe that we have to go our own way and to disarm North Korea. And we need to do so soon. Why? Well, the reasons really go way beyond the scope of today's talk. But let me just say this. An international system that cannot defend its most vital interests against one of its weakest members cannot last. So we have no choice but to succeed. But no nation, however, has found a satisfactory way to deal with North Korea, neither its few friends nor its numerous foes. So therefore, the question is, what do we do now? First, we need some historical background. Since 2003, the Bush administration has committed itself to multilateral diplomacy, namely the six-party talks that have been nominally sponsored by Beijing. In addition to China and North Korea, Russia, Japan, and South Korea have joined us around the table. Multilateral diplomacy was supposed to deny the North Koreans to play one nation off against the other. And more importantly, it was to show the Koreans that there was a broad coalition arrayed against Kim. The theory of this approach was sound. After all, the lineup looked very favorable to Washington. On one side of these talks was the solar system's undisputed heavyweight champion, the Seoul superpower. There were also two other nuclear armed nations at the table, one of them the world's most populous state, and the other its largest as measured by geographical area. There was also on the same team the planet's second largest economy and a nation that had Asia's fourth largest. Together, these five nations accounted for 31% of global population and 47% of its economic output. And on the other side? On the other side was a destitute and reviled regime that represented one third of 1% of humanity and an even smaller portion of its economy. That was the theory. And for a time, it actually worked. Today, unfortunately, we're going to have to skip all the fascinating details and fast forward to September 
2005. In 2005, there was a, what was described as a quote-unquote breakthrough. All six parties to the Beijing deliberations issued a statement of principles that month. North Korea committed itself to giving up, quote, all nuclear weapons and existing nuclear programs. We should not be surprised that this month there was a breakdown in the six-party process. Assistant Secretary of State Christopher Hill, who was Washington's chief negotiator at the six-party talks, had promised the American people three years ago that he would not paper over differences or kick the can down the road. But that is exactly what Washington did with the six-party process and the joint statement. The statement is imprecise, even for a document of its type. There is no mention in the statement of North Korea's uranium nuclear weapons program, which after all is what got the six-party talk started. And there's only a passing reference to the verification of North Korea's promise to disarm. There are no details regarding the nature or the extent of the various parties' obligations, and only the vaguest references as to when they must perform their obligations. When the world needed an enduring solution, when it needed a definite roadmap to how to get there, America accepted an arrangement that permitted even more North Korean delaying tactics and bad faith negotiation. So why did Hill and the Bush administration agree to such an unsatisfactory arrangement? The United States approved the statement because it essentially, from a political point of view, it had no choice. Chinese negotiators presented the statement because it was their plan on a take-it-or-leave-it basis. And they told Hill that they would blame the United States if we did not accept it. Pyongyang, immediately perceiving American weakness, then pressed its advantage. First, it conducted a test of a small nuclear device in October 2006. Next, North Korea got Washington to sign on to another interim deal, that in February of last year. In that agreement, North Korea promised it would implement a two-step plan to dismantle its nuclear weapons program. Then, then it maneuvered the United States into unfreezing dirty money held into a, in a bank in Macau, even managing to get the Federal Reserve to facilitate the transaction, which was undoubtedly illegal under American law. This was one of the most humiliating incidents in the annals of American diplomacy. Having humiliated the United States, Pyongyang then saw no need to admit that it had a uranium weapons program, to say anything about its sales of nuclear expertise around the world, or be candid about its store of plutonium. The North Koreans were supposed to hand in a complete and correct, quote unquote, declaration by the end of last year, according to another interim deal that was signed in October. As we all know, that did not, in fact, happen. The North Koreans did allow American diplomats to carry home 18,000 pages of documents in May of this year, and the documents did contain something valuable. It's not what the documents said, it was what was on those documents, specifically traces of highly enriched uranium. So now we have confirmation that North Korea does have a secret supply of fissile material, and in all likelihood that it has a covert nuclear weapons program based on uranium. The disclosures of the uranium traces essentially led to a breakdown in the negotiations. We can say that all things considered, the breakdown in the talks was predictable. Since 1993, Pyongyang has created crises to avoid submitting to inspections. This time, it's walking away from the talks because it cannot agree to a protocol on the verification of its pledges to disarm. It is now clear, if it wasn't clear before, that Kim Jong-il and crucial regime elements have not, have not made the critical decision to disarm. Well, now it's time to take a little tour through the domestic politics of the five other nations involved in the six-party talks. The great disappointment in these talks is Russia. 
The Kremlin has been quiet since 2003, acting as if the nuclearization of North Korea, with which it shares a border, is really not its business. This year, Moscow signaled that Korea was even less important than before because at the end of, the Mar end of March, it replaced a senior diplomat with a junior one, Alexei Borodavkin, whose main area of expertise is Europe. Russia's increasingly hostile approach to the international community, which of course was best typified by its invasion of Georgia last month, confirmed also has now sort of seeped into its North Korea policy, this hostility. In the last few days, Moscow has gone forward on a pledge to, extale, to extend a rail line to a North Korean port. So this suggests that Moscow is going to continue to bedevil America now in the six-party process as well. On to Japan. For decades, Tokyo maintained a close relationship with Pyongyang and was in reality a supporter. Koyazumi, the charismatic former prime minister, risked a split with Washington by going to the North Korean capital to try to negotiate a settlement of Korea's historical claims against Japan. Kim Jong-il, in an attempt to pave the way for a settlement in which he expected at least $10 billion from the Japanese, admitted in September 2002 that his agents had kidnapped 13 Japanese citizens. He subsequently returned five of them, and he said that the others had died. Among those who were said to have expired was Megumi Yokoto, a schoolgirl who was 13 when she was abducted. The eager Koyazumi was willing to ignore the improbable and implausible explanations that Kim Jong-il was giving him, but the normally supine Japanese public, however, would have none of it. Japanese citizens who were led by Yokoto's enraged parents said that they did not want to deal until there was a fair and full, complete accounting of the abductees. That's something that Kim Jong-il, to this day, has yet to provide. Taro Aso, the new Japanese prime minister, is often described as a nationalist. He appears temperamentally unwilling to do a deal with the North Koreans. But it really doesn't matter what he thinks, because his Liberal Democratic Party is hanging on to power by a thread, and there's no way that he can sponsor a cynical deal with the North Koreans, even if he were inclined to do so. So, at least in the next few years, I don't see the Japanese government normalizing relations with the North Koreans. They're certainly not going to provide aid, and they very well may stand in the way of a six-party deal. The result is that Tokyo's position on North Korea is more resolute than ours. Now that we've gone through Russia and Japan, let's go to the main weapon, the main area of, of interest, and that is China and South Korea. Virtually everybody says that the key to a negotiated deal is China, and that is correct. In the past few years, China has provided 90% of the North's oil, 80% of its consumer goods, and 45% of its food, most of this on concessionary terms. China and North Korea are their, each other's only formal military ally, and China protects Pyongyang from its perch on the UN Security Council. Without China, there would be no North Korean nuclear program, no North Korean missile program, and no North Korea. Yet if the key to North Korea is China, the key to China is South Korea. Up until February of this year, the Chinese were able to protect that abhorrent regime in Pyongyang because Seoul was also supporting that same miserable dictatorship. For 10 years, so-called progressive governments in the South, first under Kim Dae-jung and then under No Mo Hyun, provided a crucial lifeline to Kim Jong-il. In other words, Seoul gave Beijing the cover to act irresponsibly. Moreover, South Korea's support for the North set up this perfect dynamic for Kim Jong-il. Just as Kim's father, Kim Il-sung, played Moscow off against Beijing during the Cold War, Kim Jong-il was able to play off Beijing against Seoul during the last 10 years. 
Yet Pyongyang's sweet spot in history is just about to come to a close. This February, Li Mingbok took office as president, and he wasted no time in reorienting the South's policies towards the North. At different times, Li has said different things about tying South Korean aid to North Korean disarmament. Yet, it is clear that he will be doing the following. He has already suspended aid to the North by halting the delivery of 4,000 tons of steel pipe due to Pyongyang's threat to start reprocessing. Lee has also strengthened relations with Washington. He's downgraded those with Pyongyang, and he's put Beijing on hold. Lee has complained about the Kim regime's gross abuse of human rights, which hasn't occurred during the last 10 years. And Lee is reemphasizing the importance of rebuilding the South Korean military in order to meet the threat posed by the other Korea. Not surprisingly, Kim Jong-il has not liked what he has seen. In the first week of April, he unleashed a tirade against the South Korean president. At the same time, North Korea closed its borders to South Korean diplomats and it suspended all dialogue with them. Only late last week has North Korea signaled that it wants to resume talking with Seoul. Lee is changing South Korea's policies, and as a consequence, he is leaving Beijing alone in its support for Pyongyang. And that gives Washington a rare opportunity to force the Chinese to take a clear stand. Washington, should it so choose, can force them in China to make a choice between their future, which is their cooperation with the United States, and their past, which is their military alliance with North Korea. In the past, China has defied the United States whenever it has had company. But when it's been alone, it's almost always been accommodating. It is now up to us to create the conditions under which the Chinese have no choice but to be responsible. Yet when it comes to its relationship with Pyongyang, the Chinese don't want to be responsible, and they certainly do not want to be forced to make a choice. One of their tactics is to say, well, they have really very little power over Kim. Quote, we have some influence, but we don't have the kind of a relationship where we can tell Kim what to do, says one Chinese expert in Beijing on Korea. Quote, if we tell him to do something, he doesn't listen. If we threaten him, he listens even less. Since the earliest days of the Pyongyang regime, North Korea has been famous for going out on its own. So Beijing leaders, therefore, tell visiting foreigners, and especially anxious Americans, that they cannot control Kim. Now, it is true that the tie-up between the two capitals, between Beijing and Pyongyang, is the world's oddest bilateral relationship. Hu Jintao and Wen Jiabao, China's current leaders, really have no warm feelings for Kim Jong-il. And really, they look at him as a tool. Also, they reportedly make Kim nervous. Now, their leaders may not like each other, but these two nations are locked in a permanent embrace of location. A common border both separates and divides these two partners in communism. Their border is arbitrary, it's drawn after conquest, and it leaves a single ethnic group living on both sides. It has been impossible to patrol without extraordinary effort, in winter, one can walk across the ice to China. And in the summer, all you have to do is wade. At one point, at Ibu Kwa, which means one step across, you can actually get to North Korea from China without wetting your feet. From the northern side of this border, which really is just an imaginary line, the Chinese for hundreds of years have viewed the Koreans as inferiors vassals to their grander kingdom and followers of their magnificent culture. Beijing's leaders, although they won't say this, view the Korean peninsula as their natural sphere of influence. The DPRK, as North Korea calls itself, also serves as a buffer for a truly capitalist society, South Korea, which is home to 27,000 American troops and lots of foreign ideas. Now, from the south side of this same line, the North Koreans bitterly resent their condescending overlords, as subjects tend to do. They also are contemptuous of the communists who have given up Marxism. 
They are pretty angry at their friends who recognize the enemy in Saul. And they also are suspicious of the friends who, from time to time in recent years, have sided with the Americans. Pyongyang's cadres despise the Chinese, but most important, they really feel betrayed. And that's an important reason why the North Koreans do not necessarily show gratitude to their benefactors in Beijing. Well, why should they? Beijing, the Koreans shrewdly reason, notice that all of the support that China provides is for China's benefit. And China has no choice but to keep North Korea afloat. China, after all, is not a charity. The constant flow of Chinese aid, regardless of what Kim Jong-il says or doesn't say or do or doesn't do, just shows that the Koreans have correctly psyched out this relationship. Because in this case, North Korean weakness does actually confer some strength in the relationship. And that's why North Korea can afford to annoy his benefactor at least most of the time. When the Chinese complain about Kim Jong-il, they really are expressing frustration. But I believe that the Chinese are protesting too much. If Kim Jong-il doesn't appear to sort of play along all the time, it's partly because the Chinese do not expect reciprocity each and every time. Beijing pursues its plan of supporting the Koreans, whether or not they express gratitude at any one particular time, because the Chinese know that, at least in the long run, the North Koreans will realize their debts to the Chinese. The Chinese know they have influence, and they can use it at any time, although they prefer not to do so all the time. It's good enough for the Chinese that the Koreans know their obligations and will pay back when they're asked to do so. Now, some believe that Beijing and Pyongyang have been perpetrating this successful denial and deception operation for quite some time. But whether or not we believe that this is really kabuki staged for our benefit, it's clear that China can force Kim Jong-il to act when it sees the need. In 1994 and in 2003, for instance, the Chinese, after taking some drastic measures, actually got the stubborn North Koreans to sit down at the bargaining table with us to discuss their nuclear weapons program. So all of this leads, I think, to one conclusion. The North Koreans are really subject to the will of the Chinese. The Chinese can bring them down anytime they want to. It's just they don't want to. Why not? Well, Hu Jintao, for one thing, finds Kim Jong-il useful for complicating the lives of one fellow named George W. Bush. In any event, Chinese foreign policy has not evolved to the point where Beijing is disposed by itself to interfere in the affairs of a neighbor in such a drastic manner. Most important, there is no consensus in the Chinese capital that it's in the nation's interest, in China's interest, to destroy an ally the DPRK, as a favor to a potential adversary, and that's us. China is in the middle of a once-in-a-lifetime transition. Mao Zedong was once the world's arch proliferator of nuclear weapons technologies. Many people today in Beijing, however, realize that further nuclearization of the region is not in China's long-term interest. For one thing, it's going to result in a reduction of China's relative power. And it's not just the potential rearmament of Japan, Korea, and Taiwan with nuclear weapons. It's also the potential nuclear deal between India and the United States, the world's most populous democracy and its most powerful one. And if this deal actually is approved by the Senate in the next few days, this will foreshadow an immense setback for the Chinese. But despite Beijing's recognition that proliferation no longer suits China's needs in the long term, there is no accepted strategic vision in the Chinese capital, just competing views that result in directionless diplomacy, what many people uh, mistake as nuanced diplomacy. There may be academics and foreign ministry officials who want to take constructive steps. But there are generals who enjoy bedeviling the United States and who maintain close, counter, close contact with their counterparts in the North Korean military. On Korea, basically, basically, Beijing just reacts to pressure from one nation or another, and it hopes to keep compromise with, and harmony inside of its foreign policy circles. 
the failure to develop a consensus in China has basically prevented, prevented the Chinese from using their leverage on Korea. And so therefore, the North Koreans can continue to defy and sometimes embarrass Beijing. Well, in order to disarm Kim, China must do more than just begin a fundamental shift in its foreign policy. It must complete the process of both shedding its self-image as an outsider and ending its traditional role as an adversary of the existing global order. Such a change often occurs when a rising power matures, but it only happens after perceptions have shifted over time. The fundamental problem for us these days is that China is not quite ready to assume the role of a constructive great power. Long before the Chinese make this transition, if they ever do, events on the Korean Peninsula are undoubtedly going to overtake Beijing. For instance, these days, Kim's one-man regime in Beijing looks increasingly fragile. North Korea's economy shrank in 2006 for the first time in eight years, according to the authoritative Bank of Korea. The contraction was estimated at 1.1%, and it followed a healthy 3.8% increase in 2005. Last year, gross domestic product looks like it fell by 2.3%. Moreover, we've been getting these reports over the last year of an impending food shortage in North Korea. <coughs> Flooding last summer resulted in the loss of about 11% of North Korea's crops and a dry and mild winter is, is going to result in a bad harvest this year. Especially intriguing are reports that the regime has cut back rations 60 percent in Pyongyang in February and has eliminated them altogether in March for lower and mid-level officials. There are unconfirmed reports that rations in Pyongyang were suspended for six months for others and at least some rural areas there are no rations at all. Last October a South Korean think tank said that North Korea was on the edge of famine. Kim Jong-il escaped much of the blame for the last famine in the middle of last decade when at least hundreds of thousands of North Koreans perished. But this time, there is no escaping responsibility for falling agricultural output. And because Kim is said to be furious with Seoul for trying to tie its aid to disarmament pledges, North Korea, in all probability from what we can tell, went to China in April and asked for massive food aid. Of course, North Korea is always on the edge of one disaster or another. But the law of averages says that at some point, at some point, the Kim family is not going to be lucky. Therefore, it's no wonder that regime elements are thinking of making an exit. What may be of particular significance are the rumors circulating in Seoul in the earlier part of this year that wealthy North Koreans were shipping even more money to European tax havens, especially Liechtenstein. If true, we may soon witness a new round of regime instability and weakness. So Kim Jong-il may want some help. In the past, the regime has come to terms with the international community on the nuclear issue when there were serious problems at home. The most important nuclear agreement between North Korea and the United States was the agreed framework, and that was signed up just three months after founder Kim Il-sung died, and when it appeared that North Korea might collapse. After Kim Jong-il managed to formally assume power and was able to steady the economy, he then pushed ahead with his nuclear weapons program. The Kim family only wants to bargain when the regime is at risk. And today, it looks like Kim is at risk. As we all have heard, he probably suffered a debilitating stroke sometime in the middle of last month, because the last time that anyone saw him in public was August 14th. So we can see that the North Korean economy is failing again. The Japanese are in a mood to be tough. The conservative trend in South Korea means that China has been stripped of its support from Seoul. And the succession in Pyongyang doesn't, to another Kim family member doesn't look like it's going to happen, or at least is very much in doubt. So all this comes down to one point. The United States has a once-in-a-generation opportunity 
to disarm Kim Jong-il. It can create the coalition to put the pressure on the Chinese and perhaps to wean away some of the crucial elements of the regime in Pyongyang. Of course, there are a hundred reasons why Kim won't do a deal with us. But if I can use a Soviet term, the correlation of forces says that for us, it doesn't get much better than this. And there is one reason why we should push at this moment. If we cannot succeed in disarming North Korea, who in the world is going to be looking at us for a solution on anything? North Korea is not just about Korea. And it's not just about Iran, Syria, Algeria, and every other nation that wants the bomb. Now, North Korea is also about us. Thank you. We have like just about a half an hour for question and answers. Sir, um, South Korean government has now the, one of the lowest approval ratings um, in, its, in its history since uh, the start of their presidency. Uh, so with that, how much effect would that have on um, that element of the side? The question is, uh, the South Korean president has one of the lowest approval ratings um, in history. And how is that going to affect um, South Korea's relations with the North and its ability to actually uh, affect positive change? Well, as we all know, South Korean presidents always have low approval ratings. Uh, his predecessor, No Mo Hyun, um, had um, a rating which was, I guess, about 20% very soon after taking office. And, and that seems to be the, the general problem of democracies in Asia these days. A leader takes office, and his approval ratings go down. Um, the thing about Lee's approval rating, though, is that it has climbed up a little bit. And, and clearly, the drop in approval was related to his very sort of ham-fisted handling of the American beef imports. So you know that's sort of now been pushed to the side. And so I think that the Lee administration has sort of what we gained a little bit of its balance. Clearly, um, Lee has had a very good meeting with President Bush. Um, he's established good relationships, which No Mo Hyun never had with the American president. And I think that, therefore, South Korea can actually play a very important role um, if the United States actually wants to take uh, this matter and, and run with it. Unfortunately, right now, the Bush administration appears exhausted and doesn't seem to know what to do about Korea. But should it ever decide upon a strategy, I'm sure that it will be able to marshal both Japan and South Korea. Because I do believe that Lee's problems were temporary and that things are going to get better in Seoul. Are you picking questions or I? Oh, you can do it, yeah. Uh, do you believe that there's a fundamental divide in the Bush administration between uh, hawks and doves? The uh, question is, is there a fundamental divide in the Bush administration between hawks and doves on Korea? Um, it appears there is a fundamental divide in the Bush administration on most issues of foreign policy, also including Iran. Um, and so yes, I, I do think that there is. I mean, on Korea specifically, um, Christopher Hill and Condoleezza Rice at least in the last couple of years, have been able to sideline other elements in the administration. Um, and that was basically led by the vice president and some others. The interesting thing, though, is that this divide is, is starting to reassert itself and starting to affect policy. And the reason is that um, Assistant Secretary of State Hill came up, a de came up with a deal on verification with the North Koreans in a meeting in Singapore a month or two ago. And that deal did not fly in Washington. It not only didn't fly with the Hawks, it also didn't fly with many people in the nonproliferation community. And certainly, it was just greeted almost universally with, um, I guess the best word to say is non-approval. And that really has permitted um, the more hardliners in the administration to reassert themselves. I, I believe that the United States, regardless of everything, can come to a deal with North Korea for a lot of reasons. Some of them are historical. Some of them are, are present day reasons. But the one thing that we can't do is we can't buy the North Korean nuclear program every five years. We can buy it once. And the problem is 
Today's controversy and the split within the Bush administration is over verification of North Korea's promises to disarm. It's the question of what is that verification protocol going to look like? And I believe it has to be a tough one. I believe the Bush administration can come along and offer a lot of, of quote unquote carrots for the North Koreans, but it does need to make sure that when the deal is done that there is no more fissile material and no more nuclear devices in North Korea. And that's going to be very hard, but nonetheless it's something that we need to do. So yes, there is a divide and today it is actually affecting policy in a very fundamental way. Yes? So you alluded both directly and indirectly to the possibility of regime change in North Korea. Uh, how might that take place? What would that look like? And then what would the fallout kind of likely be? Because it seems to me that the, all the actors in the six party box would have a huge interest in that. The question is, um, um, could, you, could you just repeat that last part again? In terms of the six, part, the six parties? Right. Just, how, how regime change is going to look like? Happen there, what would it look like? It okay. to me that all those nations right. have a serious okay. interest in that. The question is, what is regime change going to look like in North Korea, and how could it affect the six-party talks? Um, with Kim obviously ailing with a stroke or something, it really has brought up the issue. Let me just go through some of the fundamentals, because they are important. Um, Kim Jong-il was actually um, brought along by his father for about two decades before he, was, uh, he took over as North Korea's supreme leader. Kim Jong-il has not done the same thing with any of his three sons, none of whom is considered suitable. Therefore, this has led most people to believe, and I think that it's right, that the next type of government we're going to see in North Korea is much, much more of a collective one, much more run along the Chinese lines of a Politburo. And, and some people have said, and I think that is absolutely correct, that the Chinese want a Politburo-style government in North Korea because they're one, and they're comfortable at dealing with one, and it's much more predictable. But the only problem with that prediction um, is this, and that is Korea does not have a tradition of collective leadership. And certainly North Korea doesn't have that tradition. So I think that what we will find, at least in the beginning after Kim Jong-il either dies or passes from the scene because um, he is no longer able to function, is some sort of nominally collective leadership with the military in control, but eventually somebody and it might be a military officer, it might be a Kim relative, takes over and actually starts to gradually accumulate power and be able to sort of go back to what we have today. Now, how this affects the nuclear deal with North Korea? Well, I think that it makes, of course, very difficult at this moment for any sort of bold moves one way or the other. Because North Korea is taking bold moves I think Kim Jong-il is still functioning, and he still is able to basically call the tune. So I think that, yeah, he might have had a stroke. Yes, there are Chinese doctors still in North Korea. There's a French team of doctors there as well. But nonetheless, I think Kim Jong-il is very much um, looking at day to day what happens. Because I don't think that in a period where you have a one-man regime, where that one man is debilitated, that you could have any sort of movement, either positive or negative. Because we see a lot of negative movement, Kim Jong-il is still functioning. And because of that, I think that we still have the possibility of pushing him. Now, we have to push him in ways that are constructive for us, and we have not always been able to do that. We don't have an administration right now that really wants to tackle North Korea. But if we did, and we certainly are going to have a new administration come January 20, there is the possibility for actually moving forward. Yes, sir. Uh, sir, do you think it's likely that Russia might, um, say, intervene to help North Korea through this crisis and, you know, forge a new relationship, try to remove some of our uh, leverage? The question is whether um, Russia would intervene um, in order to reduce American leverage. I think that Russia, people have said this before, well before the Georgia invasion, and it sounded right to me at the time, and it certainly sounds right now. And that is, Russia has, for the last couple years, been focused on its near abroad, on its western boundaries. And that's the reason why, North, uh, why Russia has not been a factor in the North Korean talks. Um, I think Putin, if he wanted to, and if he had the time, and if he had the resources, I think that he would definitely make even more trouble than he is making now. But right now, 
He's got to worry about the fallout of Georgia. Also, he has, with the invasion of Georgia, he's also sparked independence movement or fervor in some of the other areas in the Caucasus. You know, he's got problems with Western Europe. He's got problems with us. He's much more interested in Hugo Chavez. I think right now, basically, Russia will needle us. If they see an opportunity, they will stick the knife in. But I don't think that they're really focusing on that. And because of that, I think that they largely will remain off the sidelines. Not to say that Russia will be a constructive power. Clearly, it will not. It's just that it's got more important fish to fry on its western boundaries. So I think that essentially, we are not going to see that much of Moscow. Of course, I hope we have been wrong, so you never know. But I don't think it will happen. Yes, sir? I'm uh, curious about Kim Jong-il, to what extent are his intellectual influences? Is he someone who's like, studied communism and like, Marxism extensively? Like Pol Pot, or is he just a thug who likes to be in power? The question is, what is Kim Jong-il's training, and how has he thought about these issues of communism and Marxism? Um, I think the easy answer and the right answer is that he basically has learned everything from his father. And what his father has done, and, and this fellow here can probably tell you a lot more and a lot better than I can, but certainly what he's done is he's fused elements of socialism. But more important, he's taken a lot of Confucianism, and he's taken strains of Korean history, and he's put them all into this idea of juche, uh, which is sort of like in, you know, self-independence uh, and, and, and trying to keep Korea away from the rest of the world. I, I think that um, that's really what drives Kim Jong-il. Basically, you, you got to put away the sense of, of what he's studied. You know, don't even think about him being a film buff. The most important thing is that he is in charge of a small country, even smaller now because it's been cut in half, a small country that is nestled between potentially hostile countries, China, Japan, and, um, and, and to a certain extent, Russia, going back to that question. So you know he's got to play this delicate balancing games in the best of times. And now he's dealing with problems at home and all sorts of other complications in his life. So I think that essentially you have to view Kim Jong-il not by his training, but sort of like where he is in terms of um, the interests of North Korea. But I think that you know, basically he's a North Korean nationalist. He wants to keep power. He's you know, your typical autocrat. You know, he wants to stay, stay in power. And he's got a one-man regime that requires a lot of effort on his part. So I think he doesn't really think too much of ideology or whatever. You know, basically what he did and this is probably the most instructive way to answer your question, is that after he took power in a one-party state, he basically ditched the Korean Workers' Party, and he based all of his power on the military, his songgong, his army first policy. You know, it's not only army first, it's army first, middle, and last. And so basically, his view on things is to stay in power through the military. So. That's, I think, sort of the way his ideology is. But as I said, you've got to look at his interests and the interests of North Korea in a very hostile environment. Yes, sir. Sir, you put together a very convincing case for the timing. The, you know, the time is now. It's a unique time to, to do something, to, to, to change um, the, the direction that things have been going with, uh, with North Korea. I, I, but uh, you also mentioned that in Here comes the but. 20th, right. And we're going to have a new president. So if, if he called you up and said, uh, what should I do? Uh, you, you convinced me. Now's the time to do something. What, what do we need to do to change it? Or to, what, what should we be doing that we're not doing right now? The question is, um, come January 20, what should the United States be doing? Well, first of all, I have to say that the new president, whether McCain or Obama, is not going to call me. So we can be pretty sure about that. <laughs> So I don't have to answer the question. Yeah. But um, if he did call, um, basically what I would say is that North Korea is perhaps the most important foreign policy issue that he has. And the reason is that this is also about Iran. And if Iran gets the bomb, which it looks like it's going to, unless it's stopped, um, the world is going to be completely different. As bad as it is now, it is going to be worse. So the idea is to concentrate on getting North Korea settled. Because if we settle North Korea, then the Iranians are going to become amazingly compliant. The Iranians and the North Koreans have been cooperating on missiles and nukes. And so therefore, there's a very clear connection. 
With regard to North Korea, I would say to him that China has never paid a price for its obstructionism on North Korea. China has facilitated dialogue, but it's never facilitated a solution. And that is something that I would say is that the United States still has leverage because the Chinese know that the stability of their state depends upon access to American markets and technology. And so therefore, I would say you've got to make the Chinese pay a price. You say, you want to be part of the real world, you, know, you want to be a great power, you can be a great power, but you've got to settle North Korea. If you don't settle North Korea, we will make you pay a price. We will start enforcing our trade agreements with you. We will stop the aid that we provide. We will make life very difficult for you. We don't make life difficult for the Chinese. For instance, they send their submarines into Japanese waters, violating Japanese territorial integrity. We say nothing. You know, they, they challenge our Navy on the high sea. We say nothing. This is just incredibly bad policy on the part of the Navy. But we can continue that if there is something better for us to gain. And that something better is North Korea. So you know, it seems to me that what we need to do is have a serious and frank conversation with the Chinese. We have this idea that we can engage them and bring them into the international system, and that they'll become responsible stakeholders, to use the State Department's hopeful formulation. But they won't be unless we make them pay a price for being bad. And we haven't done that. So that's primarily what I would say to the President when he calls on January 21st. Given the financial meltdown that the U.S. is going through right now, uh, and given how much of uh, American debt is held by the Chinese, we really have that leverage over them? Sure. Let, let's, this is going to get a little technical, but I think that we need to do it. Everybody says, OK, they hold a half trillion dollars of, of our Treasury debt and they hold a little bit more when you consider all other dollar-denominated obligations. And they hold a lot of Fannie and Freddie, for instance, which is a point of leverage. Okay. So the question is, you know, they have threatened, as they did last August, to use what they call the nuclear option, which is to start dumping dollars and dollar-denominated debt. I would say, make my day. Go do it. If they dump dollar debt or dump dollars, they got to buy something which means they got to buy instruments denominated in euros and yen as a practical matter. They do that, the euro and the yen go through the ceiling in value. So Brussels and Tokyo have to go into the market, and they've got to buy dollars. So yes, if the Chinese dumped debt, what would happen would be turbulence in the financial markets, but not for more than a calendar quarter, probably no more than a month. And the end of this process is that we would have our obligations held by our friends and allies rather than a potential adversary. And I wouldn't have to listen to this question anymore. <laughs> so now, obviously, right now is not a good time for this. But nonetheless, um, we focus, as we always do, on our own weaknesses. That's just natural. People tend to do that. But the Chinese government is focusing on their own weaknesses because their economy is headed to a very bad slowdown. When I was there in June, it was clear from everybody in Beijing that they expected a serious recession. And this was not just Beijing. This was the rest of the East Coast. So you know, people have been talking about a recession in China after the Olympics for three years now. And now it's actually happening. The Chinese are very worried about their own economy. I don't think they're going to be threatening the United States anytime soon. So are the chances of um, collapse of the regime? And who, what Which the, regime? Uh, North Korea. Okay. And uh, like what uh, benefits, I guess, are not the exact opposite of like what are bad effects with uh, the countries nearby? Um, so. The question is, um, what is the probability of a collapse of the North Korean regime? And what is the effect on the neighbors? Um, North Korea has been collapsing a long time. It's been kept afloat largely by the Chinese. And if the Chinese were ever to withdraw support, the probability for the collapse of the North Korean regime approached 95% within a year. Um, the fact that the Chinese continue to support North Korea means that the probability for a collapse of the North Korean regime you know, resides in the 10 to 15 to 20% range in the next year. Pretty low, considering all that's going on. 
Um, one thing about the North Korean regime um, which makes it more stable is that North Korea is obviously willing to kill its own people. And when you have a regime like that, it can hang on a very long time. So, you know, that's what gives the North Korean government internal stability. What um, hurts North Korea more than anything else is that the Korean people, because of the famine of last decade, had to, for the first time in their lives, support themselves. And they had to basically get on their lives without the government. And that has created a dynamic and a psychology that eventually will result in a collapse of the North Korean regime. But the question is when it's going to happen. And the when is largely dependent upon Chinese support, going back to your question about um, China's relations with Pyongyang. Um, so, you know, essentially, I sort of see that this is not going to happen unless the United States makes it happen. The effect on the rest of the neighborhood? Well, China, I don't think, would really be affected that much. You know, people say, oh, you know, the people in Beijing are worried about this flood of North Korean refugees that are going to go into Manchuria. Uh, you know, I just don't see that happening because North Koreans are Koreans. And if they're going to flee anywhere, they're going to flee to where there are other Koreans. And now, for the first time since the creation of the DMZ, there are now at least three demined corridors through the DMZ, which people can just walk across, and they don't have to worry about anything. So in the case of North Korea's collapse, the country that will be affected most, of course, will be South Korea. There will be a lot of refugees. The international community, led by the United States, with a reluctant Japan and a reluctant China, are going to come and start to bolster Seoul, because nobody has a choice but to do that. So, you know, I think that within 10 years, it's a non-story. Now, of course, in that intervening first year, it's going to be a very big story. But nonetheless, Seoul has the capability, because of its network uh, of friends and allies, and because of China, does have the ability to weather that. The reason why Seoul has, in, in the years under No Mo Hyun and Kim Dae-jung, why it became so Pyongyang-friendly was because they were afraid of a North Korean collapse and didn't want to bear the cost, because they had saw what happened to West Germany. But if the international community comes to the rescue of uh, South Korea, which I'm sure it will, I mean, eventually they'll work it out. And eventually that has to happen, because there is, until there is a unification of Korea, North Asia will remain one of the most dangerous places on Earth. Yes? You emphasize a lot uh, the influence that Seoul can have on Beijing. Uh, I don't understand why they would have a serious influence. Uh, what, what exactly does, does South Korea have that, that they could use to influence uh, China, and why does China care about them? The question is, what influence does Seoul have on China? And the question was very skeptical that Seoul could have influence. I think the influence is more just sort of if Seoul moves away, I mean, it's not sort of that South Korean diplomats can tell their Chinese counterparts what to do. It's more that if, if Seoul withdraws its support for North Korea, as it is doing now, China is left in a very difficult position because it's the only nation in the spotlight. And because of that, it's then vulnerable to pressure from the United States. So that's how I, I sort of see the, the Seoul-Beijing dynamic. It's more that Seoul can put China into a bad position by withdrawing support for North Korea. It doesn't have to have any influence on what the Chinese do. You know, the Chinese don't really respect the South Koreans because they don't really respect the North Koreans. I mean, this goes back hundreds of years where the, the Chinese have viewed the Koreans just sort of as little people who happen to live on their border. Now, as you can imagine, the Koreans don't like that attitude. Um, so the, the diplomats in Seoul have zero or close to zero influence on Beijing, but they do have the ability to put Beijing in a very difficult position diplomatically. Yes, sir. You said that the Americans could put um, actual pressure on the Chinese by enforcing agreements and uh, actually responding to the, uh, the submarines and challenging the Navy. What? what Agreements would we be enforcing, and how could we actually put pressure on them effectively? And is that a realistic uh, tool for Americans to use and actually be accepted here in America against the Chinese? 
I'm specifically thinking of China's promises that it made when it joined the World Trade Organization. Um, the United States has been very lenient on Chinese trade violations. We have filed cases with the WTO, but we've done so years late, and we have generally been very, very quiet about it. You know, one of the things you know you noticed with all of just so for, first thing we can do. Um, is um, we can make sure that we enforce our trade agreements. And, and that's very important for Beijing because they have an export-led economy. Last year, they ran up a trade surplus against the world of $262 billion. Their trade surplus against the United States was $256 billion. That means all but $6 billion of China's trade surplus related to sales to the United States. That gives us leverage if we wanted to do that. Now, we can buy our shoes in Guatemala and from uh, Honduras, or we can buy them from China. And I think that some American president needs to say that. Another example, we have let in and continue to let in Chinese products which are defective, toxic, whatever. This has been an ongoing story for the last year. We have been amazingly lax about letting this continue. We could change that attitude. We could actually say, we're testing every single shipment that comes into our country because your toys are bad. Right now in China, the biggest thing is not the Olympics. It's not the spacewalk of uh, last week. <coughs> the biggest thing in China right now is the poisoning of milk and the government's covering up of that for at least two years. This is enraging parents. The one thing to bring down a regime fastest is to kill kids, and that's exactly what Beijing has been doing. We've been letting their stuff into our country. Easy for us to say, no more agricultural products, no more toys, no more anything until we inspect at the border. We could really throw a monkey wrench into this, and it would affect China because they do need American markets to continue the stability of their state because the stability of their state is dependent upon continued prosperity. And that prosperity really is, is very much in doubt with a cyclical downturn in the Chinese economy. So now is a time where we can especially um, say something. On the submarines, you know, the, the, the Chinese have been sending their submarines uh, into Japanese waters, and nobody says anything about it. The Chinese lasered an American satellite two years ago with the intention of blinding it. And what did we say? We said nothing in public. I don't think we said anything in private either. This is a direct attack on the United States. This is an act of war. And what do we do? Oh, it didn't happen. I'm sorry I'm getting emotional, but there are a lot of things that we can say and do and that we haven't done. And we've been very patient and indulgent because, as I said, we wanted to integrate the Chinese into the international system. If we were treated them like any other country, I think that the Chinese would get the message and would become responsible on Korea and Iran and a lot of other um, issues that are vitally important to the security of the United States. Does our support of uh, our relations with uh, Taiwan influence the leverage? The question is the influence of and the relationship between Taiwan and North Korea. Taiwan and the United States. Uh, sir, yeah, Taiwan and the United States. Taiwan and North Korea have been linked cases. Um, um, and it's really been that way from the very beginning, from the Korean War, where we actually um, decided to defend Taiwan because the North Koreans invaded the South. Since then, diplomacy involving North Korea has very much been linked with Taiwan because China wants to take over Taiwan. China is a key player in North Korea. So they've always really been linked in, in our view. You know, some people say, let's do a deal. We give the Chinese Taiwan and we get North Korea. But you know, that is cynical beyond belief and something that we can't do. But nonetheless, the Chinese would just pocket Taiwan and not really help on North Korea. So I don't think that. Um, you know, we really have a basis for a deal with Beijing on, on Taiwan. But these two, area, these two countries have always been linked in, in the minds of Beijing, um, in the minds of the Koreas, and certainly in, in our mind as well, because it is an obvious area of connection between um, these three countries. Okay, we have time for two more questions. I think that one person. Yeah. Uh, you seem to suggest that North Korea 
wants to go in some way now due to a long history of uh, negotiations conducted in bad faith. Is there something now that the North Koreans want strategically from, from disengaging as they are? The question is, what do the North Koreans want at this particular moment in their nuclear discussions? I think that you know, you, it's, it's really nothing that they want now that they didn't want before. Um, basically, North Korea wants security. And they can get security by either a number of different ways, of course. One of them is to have a nuclear deterrent. The other one is to have the United States as a supporter of the regime in North Korea because we are the perfect offshore balancer. You know, we are the big power that is not going to get in their face, that has no territorial ambitions on Korean territory. So, you know, in general, I think security is, is really the thing they want. Specifically, I, I think that what they want is they want another power to balance their support in Beijing. Kim Jong-il must be very nervous at this moment that he doesn't have Seoul, that he only has China. You know, North Korea has survived by having two sponsors, which they've always played off against each other. Now Kim Jong-il has only one sponsor, and it would be great if he could have two with us. So if, if there's anything specifically that he wants at this moment that he hasn't wanted before, I guess maybe you could say that was it. You know, but in general, you know, North, Kim Jong-il is the, your, your typical dictator. He wants to stay in power. He wants to pass on power to somebody that he designates. Maybe that's something new that it hasn't been true in the past. But you know, generally, that's the way dictatorial, one-man, horrible regimes work. Sir, you were asking me to answer uh, when, on January 20th, we have a new uh, administration, what that administration needs to do and what they should do. Given the uh, criticism that has come under this administration for overextending itself, getting itself involved in too many places, and given the given the press's uh, att uh, attention to Iraq and Afghanistan, do you think it's at all likely that North Korea will be given the attention that, that it needs to? You know, I mean, we can say this should happen, but is there a chance that the next president actually will be able to? or choose to take a stand? The question is, given the United States' other commitments, especially Iraq and Afghanistan, whether um, North Korea will get the attention that I believe it deserves. No. I mean, the problem is right now, you know, we believe we were overextended. And yeah, we're overextended. But we've got to remember one thing, and that is this international system is crumbling before our eyes. And if we think things are difficult now, they're going to get a lot worse if we don't start solving some problems. You know, people like to say that we're the sole superpower, but you know, what are we accomplishing around the world? The only things I can come up with is that the surge is working, but it hasn't finally um, obtained a stable Iraq yet. So that's sort of still an item on the agenda. Afghanistan is going worse day by day. We're failing with Iran. We're failing with North Korea. You know, Latin America is boiling up against us. You know, what have we succeeded in doing? So they say in political science classes, which I never attended because Me either. <laughs> that when a hegemon fails, it fails very quickly. And this means that if we want to have a stable world order, we're going to need to have some successes. Now, I suppose you could say we could have a success someplace else. But going back to this question over here, Iran is perhaps the most critical issue. And we're not doing anything with regard to Iran right now. They are perhaps six months away from a virtual nuclear weapons capability. And when Ahmadinejad gets his finger on the button, or more appropriately, when he's able to send enriched uranium to Hezbollah, you can imagine what's going to happen to the international system. So we need to do something right, and we need to do it quickly, unless we want the world to be really bad. We were overextended in 1941 and 1942, but when the world requires it, you have to act. And we are at a dangerous moment in, in, in history because what is necessary, what is necessary from us, is not considered practical. And those times in history are always followed by uncertainty, turmoil, and death in great numbers.
we are at one of those points in history.